listening to the Cross Kingdom Sermon of the Week. We hope you enjoy this message from Justin Carpenter. How was worship? I uh, told Josh at the end there, I was literally about to not be able to play anymore. I was crying so bad. I don't know about y'all, but I needed that very much. I figured today would be good because I woke up about 1.30 in the morning last night under attack with lights flying over my head. And uh, you also woke up at 1.30? Really? Anybody else wake up and come under attack last night? Santana's always under attack. That doesn't count. Anybody else? <laughs> Anyways, so um, a few days ago, I was in twilight. Do you all know what I mean by when I say twilight? You're not fully asleep. You're not fully awake. It's very common for the Lord to give you revelation in twilight. So I want to encourage you to pay attention to the things that you see when you're in that place where you're not fully asleep, not fully awake. So I was in twilight a few days ago, and in twilight, I saw this vision of uh, this big, huge anchor, like it was just out of the water. It was a massive anchor, and I heard the phrase in my mind, the anchor still holds in 2022. And I've been pondering this, um, obviously Jesus is our anchor, right? Hope is our anchor. Who is, he's the God of hope. And so I've been pondering this, this issue of the anchor and, and asking the Lord for more revelation because obviously you could take this multiple ways, right? Um, it should be an encouragement to all of us, no matter what, that no matter what next year holds, um, it doesn't have to rock our faith, right? We don't, we don't have to, even though nations will be in perplexity, we don't have to be in a place of perplexity, even though we may not know everything that the Lord's doing in that moment, we don't have to be in a place of hopelessness or anxiety or turmoil if we're grounded and anchored in the Lord. If, if our whole goal in life, our main goal is to get as absolutely as close to Him as possible and then teach others to get as close to Him as possible. If you want to make the gospel very simplistic... Get as close to Jesus as you possibly can, and then teach absolutely as many, as many of those around you to get close to him. You know, we, we, can, we can make things very complex. We can, we, can, we can do sermons that wow people when we go super deep into the Greek and the Hebrew, and I always butcher Hebrew, so I, I may be saying another word in another language for all I know. And, uh, but it's the simplicity of the gospel. The gospel is the power of salvation. And I'm telling you, we, we're in a season where we need to see the gospel, the very power of the gospel on display. This world needs to see a community of believers that don't look half-worldly, but that they look like Jesus. You know, Jesus displayed holiness in a way that offended the religious, but it drew the sinner. His version of holiness looked totally different than what the Pharisees and the Sadducees thought it should look like. And, and he was like a magnet to those that were lost and hurting and, and needing hope. And we're, we're in a time in history where we're literally going from one, not just season, but literally everything's changing. We're shifting we're shifting uh, time frames in the history, um, in God's timeline. You know, there, everybody argues over, um, you know, God's in control. A lot of times we say God's in control because we just don't want to take responsibility for the earth. A lot of times we say, oh, yeah, God's in control. And really, you're just scared to be responsible for what he's given you. And the truth is, it says the heavens are the heavens, Right. But he's given the earth to the sons of men. And many times when we're in turmoil, when we're in darkness and, and the poop's hitting the fan, 
we're over here asking God to do something and God's going, why aren't you doing something? I've already given you the authority and the power. Why, why aren't you praying? Why aren't you standing up? Why aren't you being my mouthpiece? Because I've, you're, he's already in you. I told somebody this week, I said, do you realize Christ in you, the hope of glory? I said, it's not about us getting more of God. It's about God getting more of us. Because if he is in you, he can't get any closer. Yeah, you ever get, you ever run into those people? I want to be very polite here. You ever run into those people that, like, they don't know their boundaries when you're talking with them in conversation? Like, they get so close, they know what you had for dinner last night. And, and I'm like, and I learned a trick from a friend of mine, another minister, John, whom you all know. John told me, he goes, Justin, he goes, I will just do this. I will lead with a foot because then that keeps distance. But some people don't know their distance, right? And you get all uncomfortable because you're like, look, kiss me or move away, you know? And uh, was, was that over the line? I'm sorry. So be it. <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. I'm leaving that alone. So... But the reality is, y'all, Jesus is literally, the Godhead is inside of you. And even when you don't feel him, he is in you. That anchor that holds our hope is inside of you. The kingdom is inside of you. And if we want to see the kingdom of heaven advance on the earth, then we have to let it advance inside of us. And we have to understand what are the signs of the kingdom. We have to know when the kingdom is advancing. Or how about this? When the Holy Spirit's trying to advance the kingdom through you, but you're under a spirit of stupid in that moment, and you don't recognize it. Like, we have to get into a place where our spiritual sensitivity is heightened. And and I want to tell you that that there's a tension in that because I tell people all the time, yes, I'm a seer, but I turn that thing way down when I'm in public. Because it is overwhelming to see and feel in the spirit all the time. And so it says like the spirit of the prophet subject to the prophet. So our gifts that God's put inside of us, like we can't go do something crazy and then say, oh, the Lord made me do that. The Lord doesn't make you do anything. That's a violation of your will. He can motivate you, ask Jonah. Not, not Jonah. Where's the other Jonah? Oh, Jonah was here, Prio, but... He knows how to motivate us, but the reality is, no matter what comes your way, we have this amazing opportunity to stay anchored in our faith. We have this opportunity to allow the peace of Christ that passes understanding to actually become a tool of evangelism in a world that's in chaos right now. Literally, by you walking into a room, if you're abiding in peace, you're going to release peace And they're going to want to know what that peace is. And too many times as believers, we'll walk into a room and we can tell you everything that people are caring and struggling with, but we can't tell you what God wants to do in that moment. That is an inferior way of walking in spiritual warfare. The superior way or the mature way is to actually find out what Jesus wants to do in that moment. God, okay, so I picked this up, I picked that up. All right, so what's your answer, Lord? What do you want to do? Are you with me? So if you have your electronic Bibles or real Bibles this morning, Hebrews 6, 13 to 20. For when God made a promise to Abraham, since he had no greater by whom to swear, he swore by himself, saying, Surely I will bless you and multiply you. And thus Abraham, having patiently waited obtain the promise for people swear by something greater than themselves and in all of their disputes an oath is final for confirmation so when God desired to show more convincingly to the heirs of the promise the unchangeable character of his purpose he guaranteed it with an oath so that by two unchangeable things in which it is impossible for God to lie we who have fled for refuge might have strong encouragement to hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters into the inner place beyond the curtain, 
where Jesus has gone as a forerunner on our behalf, having become a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So it says that, hold fast to the hope set before us. We have this as a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul. You know, <clears throat> that this issue of hope, when you look at the, the Hebrew word, for, or the Greek word for hope, when we lose hope and our, our hearts get sick, it says hope deferred makes the heart sick. There's actually, it, it shows a picture of you just taking your hope and laying it aside. But it says hope that's seen is not hope at all. So we get frustrated because we go through this process, this time period, this, this journey where we have hope for something, hope for a breakthrough, hope for a new job, um, uh, hope for a new spouse. No, I'm joking. Hopefully, if you're not married, you may have hope for a spouse. And we, we, we are on this. Some of y'all got offended by that. It's okay. Um, and, we, and we have this hope. But it's like whether we recognize it or not, we've put an expectation on God that we say, okay, Lord, we're going to wait this long. And then if it's not done in this time period, you've abandoned us. Where are you at? It's like Elijah. I'm the only prophet left. And there were 7,000 other people. 7,000 that did not kiss Baal. And the enemy loves to demoralize us and, and try to get us to throw our hope away or toss it aside, picture a future without Jesus, and then just try to keep us crushed in that place of hopelessness. And, the, and this battle right here, all of the thoughts, your mind's like a filter. And it's a beautiful thing because even though you don't have control over every thought that comes into your mind, you can actually have an opportunity to filter what's there before it gets here. And you can actually take captive those thoughts that aren't from him when they're here instead of needing inner healing and deliverance because once it's here, it gets a lot stickier. And um, earlier this week, I was reading and, and Jesus in the Gospels and, and Jesus, um, he's in the garden and he calls Judas his friend. He, calls, he says, friend, do what, you're, what you've come to do. And it wasn't sarcastic, right? Think about this. Jesus was despised by men. He was tested and tempted in every way possible, and he never lost hope. Jesus never doubted what he came for because his anchor was the Father. His identity was in his Father. And he went through all of these things. He, he put a thief in charge of the treasury, knew he was a thief, and yet all of these things, he trusted his father's heart. At one point he said, shall I not drink of this cup? It's hard to drink bitter cups if your salvation is not anchored in the Lord. A lot of times I think our salvation is anchored in circumstance. We have giant faith when things are going good for us. And then we're in turmoil when they're not. See, I don't think Jesus is, is nearly as concerned about your destination <clears throat> as he is your process with him. Because the process is the journey. The journey is your destiny. And you can, you can be going down all these different paths. People get stuck so many times because they find themselves in a transitional period in their life and there's five paths before them and they're scared to death to choose the wrong path, but Jesus is at the end of every one of them. And so many times we, we think maturity is God telling us what clothes to wear, what to eat for breakfast, like, like almost like control. And that's not maturity. There, there are things where God says, oh, you got three choices? Which one do you want to do? I mean, if, if you were dressing your 20-year-old son or, how, or your 20-year-old comes to you, hey, mom, what color of boxer should I wear? Huh? But we do that with the Lord because there's still this lingering fear of punishment because we, can't, we haven't quite settled into the reality of our relationship with him, really where we stand with him. And when we think we do, then little things like that come up. The fear of punishment is so, um, so normal to so many people 
They don't even realize that's what's motivating them. When you get tired and exhausted and you're running hard, it's usually because you fear something. Right? Be anxious for nothing, but at all things by prayer and supplication. Make your anxiety go through the roof and fall apart. No, that's not what it says. <laughs> Hebrews 11.1 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. <clears throat> When hope becomes sight, there's no need for hope. We have the hope of our salvation, and that hope will disappear because it will become sight when Jesus returns and redeems us, when we are resurrected. I know many of you are hoping for the overtaker, not the undertaker. (laughs) Sorry, I guess that was a dad joke. But Proverbs, but Proverbs 13, 12, hope deferred makes the heart sick. But when the desire comes, it is a tree of life. I'm convinced right now with all of my heart that God wants to blow the church's mind. It says, neither eye has seen, nor ear has heard, nor, neither has entered into the heart of man what God's prepared him. But he is revealing it to us, right? His children. And I'm absolutely convinced that now's the time, Jeremiah 33, 3, call on him. Right, Because he wants to show us things. It, when, when things get turbulent and things get difficult, I think the Lord's rolling his sleeves up and going, all right, now we get to do something. Because pressure produces quality, quality of character. And, and, and pressure is going to actually put you into an evaluation mode. When pressure comes, you're actually going to find out where you really are in Christ with your maturity level, not where you think you are. Anybody ever had a trial hit and you're like, um, okay, so I thought I was better off than that, right? And God in his mercy, especially when you pray, pull down my strongholds, guess what? God in his mercy, he starts applying pressure to those areas of deception because your deception means you don't know it's there. People know your strongholds are there. Ask my wife if she knows where my strongholds are. I guarantee you she knows where all of my strongholds are, even if I'm oblivious to half of them, right? So I bought some new rims this past week for my Jeep, and I felt like Aaron, you know what I'm saying? Uh, You know, Aaron, after he, he built that golden calf, he's telling Moses, Moses, I don't know what in the world happened. I took all this gold, I threw it in the fire, bam, out popped the calf. Well, I was at Discount Tire Store getting my tires balanced and rotated, and bam, out popped new rims. I have no idea what happened. But, no, she, it's been a really long time since I've done a, a bigger purchase without saying anything. So there was, a, there was an opportunity to test our maturity level in that moment, Right? <laughs> Of course, I was very mature with that decision, and Lisa realized she just wasn't quite as mature as she thought, and we just moved on. (laughs) Man, look, Brayden Toomey walked out on that one. (laughs) But, all right, now that I didn't wear my boots today... um, yeah, thank you. I'll stop. No, actually, it, 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 was a, it was a very spontaneous purchase I had not planned on, and it would have worked out better if I would have mentioned it to her first. See, your pastor's human. So, so be it. So be it. <laughs> Psalm, <laughs> Psalm 37, 4, delight yourself also in the Lord, and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Delight yourself in the Lord who will give you the desires of your heart. There's this beautiful exchange that happens that when we're actually, we begin to delight ourselves in the Lord, that there's an exchange of desires. All of a sudden, his desires become our desires and he's justified to answer our prayer. Because anything you ask according to his will, it's done, Right? Back where Proverbs thirteen twelve in um, in the Hebrew, oh, uh, it's Mishalah. 
Correct? Rich is, I'm not looking over there, Rich. Go with it. And so we, we have to recognize that in this issue of, of the journey of losing, we have a choice. Hope seen is not hope. And for some reason, we feel like hope should be seen. And it says right there in the Word that hope isn't seen. So when you have hope for something, you actually have hope for something that's not seen yet. And right now, no matter where you're at in your life, you absolutely need hope for something in your life. I don't care. After, after you've seen a million prayers answered, God's taking you deeper, and it's going to take hope. Faith plus hope equals trust. Faith plus hope equals trust. And if we take our hope and say, okay, well, Lord, it's been three weeks since I asked you for this. I'm just going to throw it away. You're actually making your own heart sick by saying, I'm done with hope. And you're, and you're removing yourself out of the anchor. Jesus is the ship. You're anchored in him. And it's like you're bailing out of there. Saying, all right, it's been long enough. I tried you. I'm going to try something else. And then all of a sudden, we, we're in this place of anxiety, uncertainty, because he is the anchor of our soul. He's the one that brings us in. He is the veil. You know, I loved uh, in Hebrews, it says, about this, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you're dull of hearing. You ever notice sometimes, Lisa will get mad at me if I say someone's stupid, but the Bible says, don't be stupid. Does it not? So, like, obviously, we have the potential to be stupid, according to Scripture. And you'll sleep better knowing that. <laughs> For though by this time you ought to be teachers, someone to teach you again, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles. In other words, you still need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for mature. For those who have their powers of discernment trained by practice to distinguish good and evil. Hebrews 5, 11 to 14. You know, many times our hearts are not set on pilgrimage. And we get our soul into the infection, our affections and cares of this world. And we're deceived into uh, believing God's got to answer our soulish desires. Or maybe you're holding on to words that tickled your ears, but it wasn't necessarily a word from the Lord. And so, if you find yourself this morning in a place of delay or, or hopes deferred and you, and you feel heart sick. When I was playing um, on the drums earlier, I was sitting there thinking... There's things I had joy for some years ago. Like just, it's that awe and wonder, that childhood faith. There's, it's like everything is, when you have a childlike faith, everything's new. You know, that's one of the beauties about keeping a childlike faith with the Lord, is that there's a sense of wonder and awe and majesty, and you find this beauty in everything around you, and everything, it's like you're in awe, and you're like, you're wowed by the Lord. And we can get into these ruts. And I realized this morning there was areas that, man, there was no sense of wonder anymore. It was just mundane. It was just routine. It was just like an old rut and just waiting for its, the process to get done. So what happened there? I, I lost my hope for it to be different. See, when we lose hope, we can just begin to settle in and go, oh, I guess that's how it's going to be. Well, I've been praying for healing for this sickness for five years. Well, I guess it's never going to happen. And in that moment, you took the very fuel that gave you perseverance and you cut off the gas line because it's the hope that keeps you going. It's, David said, I would, have, I would have fainted had I not known I'd see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And so... What anchors us is the Lord and his promises for us. And that where it says, you haven't yet resisted unto the shedding of blood. You have need for perseverance. And yeah, we're not good for perseverance, are we? A lot of times. 
I didn't want to work out at all Saturday morning. And uh, I had need for perseverance. So I took a couple of quads to uh, ramp up my motivation. It returned hope back into me. <laughs> but Psalm 37, 4. Um, sorry, wrong scripture. I'm going to land the plane here in a minute on recovering hope. You know, suicide's up right now. Depression's up. Anxiety's up. We, we, um, there's been a bunch of abnormal uh, premature deaths in our area recently. Crazy car accidents, and, you know, we lost a football player from Tyvee, and, and um, you can lose hope if you take your eyes off the Lord and begin to put them on the circumstances and what's happening in this season. You can begin to doubt whether or not, you know, maybe God's up there biting his fingernails. You think he's nervous? Or do you think he, you think he knows what's going to happen tomorrow or the next day? Romans 5, 3 to 5 says this. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings. We rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit, who has been given to us. So do you understand this process that the things that we suffer, suffering produces endurance, endurance, endurance produces character, and character actually produces hope. That's the process. That doesn't sound very delightful at times, but that's the process that we have to go through. Romans 12, 12 says, Rejoice in hope, be patient in tribulation, be constant in prayer. So there's this issue, this perseverance, this, this ability to understand God's ways. Because so many times when we get in painful circumstances, we think it's God's will that we shouldn't be there. And he may have just spent the last six months lining you up to put you in there. Because he cares way more about your character than your comfort. He cares way more about your character. And so many times we cut the process short. We cut off hope. We, we do everything possible in our soulish ability to remove ourselves from pressure and pain. But guess what? You're not going to raise the dead without maturity. Greater things than this you will do because I go to the Father. I think the Lord's waiting for us to be willing to pay a price, to stay anchored to Him, and pay a price to develop character inside of us that can actually carry the weight of the glory of His kingdom that He wants to pour out. And I don't think the issue is Him. I, I think that we need to look in the mirror and say, Lord, I have all of you I want right now. Please forgive me. Stir in me so I want more. It says if we draw near to him, he'll draw near to us. So what if right now in this moment you have all of Jesus you want? Are you satisfied? Hebrews 10, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, works not neglecting to meet together, 
as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. You know, you ever see those illustrations where they're, they're, they're mining? They're trying to hit like the, the gold mine or the diamonds. And you see that guy, he gives up and he's like one foot away from the gold mine. I, I think there's so many unanswered prayers because we got tired of not seeing what we were striving for, what we were contending for. And we stopped. Maybe hours before it was going to be answered. Daniel fasted and prayed for 21 days, and Gabriel shows up after 21 days. And the interesting part of that is that he said, your prayer was heard the moment you spoke. It says he'll an- there's, there's a scripture that says he'll actually answer us before we even ask for it, because he knows what you're about to think. He knows what you're about to ask for. He told David after he committed adultery, he, he goes, I gave you this and 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 it had that not been enough, if you just would have asked, I would have given you more. See, that's the Father. That's the heart of the Father. And when we grab a hold of the goodness of God, we understand His character. We understand His heart. Even when we mess up, we know we can go running back to Him. We can jump up in his lap and know that he's not going to condemn us, but he's going to love us. I guess the joy of the Lord's breaking out in the men's bathroom. So be it. Okay, last scripture. Hang in there. I'm landing. Ephesians 1, 15. For this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation and the knowledge of him, having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, And what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion, and above every name that's named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And so there's three main things there. There's the hope of your calling, inheritance of the saints, and the the immeasurable greatness of his power. Aren't you ready for some, like, power encounters? Aren't you ready for, like, okay... You call on your God, and I'm going to call on my God, and whoever answers by fire, he's God. Yes. That, that's the type of, of those mountain power encounters. Like, we need to be charging into all of these places in the midst of this antichrist spirit and all the communism crap that they're trying to pour onto our nation, and we need to stand up, resist it, speak truth, and say, you call on your God, and I'm going to call on my God, and we'll see who answers. By the way, they, two days ago, they finally put a halt to the, ma- the vaccine mandate. But we've got to keep praying as a nation, Right? And here's a little side note as I land and listen, y'all, please pray for wisdom in these times. The ones that are telling you what to do for your health don't care about your health, period. I hate to break that to you, but just pray for wisdom. You have to have wisdom in these times. You understand? It says, redeem the time for the days are evil. Right? Be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove. 
Don't let all this garbage separate us as a body of Christ. But also have wisdom. It says, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Ask. If any of you lacks wisdom, he says, just ask me and I'll give it to you unbridled. We need wisdom and revelation now more than ever. We, we, need, to, we need to be on this firm foundation. We need to be anchored in Christ so that no matter what storm comes your way, that you're not being tossed back and forth on a wave. That, you, that you're not crying out in fear when Jesus is sound asleep. I want to challenge you. The next storm that comes into your life, find out where the Lord's pillow is and join him. All right, we all stand. Hey, Sean, we. You... Oh, he's playing something. If the prayer teams would come forward. Thank you for listening. For more messages and other resources, please subscribe to this podcast or go to our website at www.crosskingdom.org.